Hello and welcome to The Kamla Show. We bring you interviews and conversations with newsmakers, filmmakers, entrepreneurs, technologists from in and around the Bay Area. Today, my guest is Congressman Mike Honda, the Congressman for Silicon Valley. Thank you for coming to the show. Well, it's nice to be here, Kamala. Thank you. So, uh, how long are you here this time? Well, we've been here about four weeks, five weeks, um, and ready to go back uh, for a Monday um, interesting meeting in Congress. What prompted you to run for Congress? Well, actually, I wasn't interested in running for Congress until um, my wife gave me permission. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were already in Sacramento. You were yeah, already part a, of local politics. Yes, I was in the Assembly, and um, um, the sitting uh, congressperson, um, Tom Campbell, had decided to uh, run for Senate, and so that created a, a vacancy, and uh, quite a few people were interested in it. Uh, I was more interested in moving on education at the state level. And then uh, folks like Zoe Lofkin um, and other folks uh, was indicating that, you know, that I should run and that I could win. And it was until my wife said, um, you know, you, you're gone three to four days in Sacramento. You'll be gone three to four days in D.C. I'm not quite sure what the difference is as far as she was concerned. And she said, your, your friends want you to run. Uh, it's important for them. It's important for their party. Uh, so I think you should. So that was kind of a permission to do that. So. Uh, I'm glad I did. I've, I've learned so much uh, being in Congress. What have you learned? Well, number one, I, I've learned that we got to do a better job of teaching our, our, our electorate and the constituents in this country the, the government process and, uh, and that uh, we have to find a better way to engage the, the, the community in what we do on a daily basis so that they take a, a interest in what's going on because if we don't do things right in Congress, uh, it eventually impacts the local local government and local folks. Uh, you know, the old saying, uh, Washington, D.C. sneezes and local government gets the flu. Mm. So how have you helped uh, the local, uh, your local constituents understand more about how Congress functions? Well, there's a variety of ways. Uh, one is uh, I visit different uh, high-tech sites to understand what they do and you know, that's like being a school teacher, it's field trips, and I, I gather all that information and I put it together in my head. Second, uh, I, I go to schools and classrooms and I talk to uh, different classrooms at the high school and middle school level, sometimes elementary, and just uh, share information and, uh, and insights. After 9-11, I did go to um, Pioneer High School and met with about 50 student leaders and sort of facilitated a, a discussion on what was going on with them. And it was uh, a very powerful meeting uh, for me and for hopefully for the young people about uh, respect and uh, understanding people's um, feelings about you know, what we say, how we say it, and, uh, and respecting uh, clothing, artifacts of religion, and uh, our different uh, backgrounds. Uh, the other thing I've, I've learned also is that uh, there's a lot of um, attention needs to be paid to special interests and that the special interest does not um, um, put out uh, our constituents in, in, in ways that would be um, unhelpful. Uh, for instance, uh, when we did the um, bankruptcy re reform, one of the things that slipped through was, uh, it was it was modified towards the end of that the bill process was um, you know youngsters who have uh, student loans, mm. and if they have problems about paying it back, uh, that's one thing that's not dischargeable in a bankruptcy thing. And so, you know, this is why a lot of young people are, are caught in this dilemma of um, high, uh, high uh, student loans and high interest. And uh, so we have to figure out how we can help them. And so, you know, people who write laws, um, we have to be very careful that uh, when we do write those laws that it helps um, and doesn't hinder uh, people's uh, ability to uh, function in this country. So how do, how was that the problem resolved about the student loan and bankruptcy? It's not it's not resolved. It became very apparent when student loans became um, part of the financial institutions uh, arena, where they were able to take tax dollars and provide uh, financial assistance to students at a at a commercial rate, and uh, that was the only game in town. And so when um, 
President Obama took over, he made sure that financial institutions did not have that practice or the ability to give out loans like that and put it back into uh, better hands. And uh, But the fact remains is that a lot of students have high loans now, mm. a tremendous amount of loans at, at a high interest rate. So we have to figure out how we can help them. That keeps the young people from going into higher, higher education, higher institutions, because uh, they, they just can't see um, um, creating a, a um, a heavy load financial uh, responsibility on in terms of debt after school. So uh, we have to remove that barrier and make it uh, easier for them to be able to go to school mm. and pay for it too. So education is uh, something that is, uh, you're very passionate about because you were a school teacher and <coughs> we have a picture of you as a, <laughs> as a principal. Uh, you were principal of two schools? I was a principal of two elementary schools, yeah, and they were, it was fun. It was um, a challenge, and I think that uh, what I enjoyed was it tested me as a person to see if I can um, turn a school around that's been um, boarded up and things like that. And, uh, oh, the school was boarded up. Well, a lot of the windows were boarded up because it was not treated well, and so to return that school site back to the community and having them own it so that they take care of it, and uh, so the students and teachers are safe on campus. And mm so that they can do what they have to do is teach and the youngsters learn. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's fun to watch that, returning the, the schools back to the community. Did you ever take student loan when you went to college? No, but I did get a NDEA um, grant, um, National Education Defense Grant, that uh, me and a couple of students, uh, graduate students, we wrote a grant and uh, received a grant to be able to do our uh, master's program in counseling. Hmm. My wife did, uh, she did uh, get a lot of student loans and because she taught in um, high need areas that uh, her loans were forgiven um, over a few over a few years. Uh, so loans can be forgiven? If you structure right, if you write the laws properly, uh, you can, laws can be, uh, laws can be written whereas students who go into, say if they go into medicine and we have a ruling that says that if you take you practice your medicine in a high needs area, that the loans could be um, forgiven, half of it uh, after a couple of years and another half uh, after that. So you know we can structure it, uh, but we have to be able to write it and pass it. And uh, I think that you know in the area of medicine and education, uh, I think those are the two areas that it would be um, primary in my mind to uh, in encourage young people to go into uh, medicine and in teaching. When you look at the education uh, sector uh, in, in America, um, you know, uh, there, there have been a lot of uh, articles, a lot of conversations about how broken the system is. And each state is different. But if we look just at 17th district, you know, the district that you represent, how is the education system here in your backyard? It's pretty good. It's, um if we're able to get the entire country at that same level in, in uh, District uh, 17, I, I think that the issue of uh, quality education will take a um, will take a, a back burner because the uh, the educational um, system is, is is pretty good, uh, and I think that people uh, they've worked hard at it. But this, but you cannot look at just one district. And but say, are there is there room for improvement with the online courses and you know the massive online sure. courses? There's always room for improvement in any district, even in Palo Alto, Beverly Hills. Uh, it's there's always room for uh, improvement, and the improvement would come in the area of what we call equity, that each child uh, receives exactly what that child needs, um, and um, the distribution of resources be distributed in ways that the resources are addressing the needs of each and every child. Right now, the way we uh, handle resources and, and funding for schools is based upon ADA, average daily attendance. And that means X amount of money behind each child. So if it's the same amount of money behind each child, then we're assuming that each child has the same needs, mm. right? And so that's equal amount, but that's not equity. Mm. It's parity, mm. and that's it's a very, uh, interesting concept to understand in order to move forward in resolving some of the problems we face in this country.
Hmm. So moving on from education to technology, sure. um, you represent Silicon Valley. How have you seen the Valley change? Because you were born not far from here. You were born in Sacramento. Yeah. But then when you were a young child, you came back and sure. your parents lived in San Jose. Um, how have you seen the valley change and what does technology mean to you? Well, <clears throat> my mother was born here in 1916. My father was born in Amala Grove. Um, in, near in, Sacramento. Uh, yes, near, in 1914, right off the river. It used to be a riverboat town where steamboats would stop, pick up wood, leave produce, pick up produce, and go on to Sacramento. Like and Mississippi then, River? Exactly. And then go back to San Francisco, so that would be the route. We came back here to San Jose in 1953, and we lived in a little shack in a cherry in a cherry orchard. We have a picture of you in the strawberry. Well, yeah, that was a couple of years later that we we went into uh, sh uh, sharecropping of strawberries. My father. That's thought you we on could the left. Cloud. That's you on the left, right? Yeah, the skinny kid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you first came in '53 and lived in a shack. Well, we lived in a, yeah, we lived in a, a farm, farm worker shack uh, in, in a straw, uh, in a uh, cherry orchard. It, it was nice because we were outside, we were open. You know, coming from Chicago, uh, you never saw the horizon because there were so many, what I call the urban canyons there. But coming out to California, you, you got fresh air, open space. You know, we ran around a lot and we, we saw birds and lizards and uh, snakes and all kinds of uh, animals that we didn't see. In, uh, in the streets of Chicago. So it was uh, a wonderful place for a young person to grow up. It is now called in Sunnyville, the Sunken Garden Golf Course. Oh. Right, we lived right on the edge of that. And, and right so, off of 230, no, on uh, Maud. Right, right off of uh, Henderson and uh, El Camino. Yes, yes. Yeah, and how it changed uh, from where we lived then, um, you had to pack a lunch in order to go down the street to El Camino, grab a bus, and go to downtown mm -hmm. San Jose. That's how long it would take. Today, you, know, you could take a lunch break and get to San Jose and come back to work you know, right away. So it, it's changed dramatically from um, a very deeply embedded uh, farming uh, and orchards. So I say that you know we went from a, a Blossom Valley um, to a Silicon Valley. Mm. We went from cow chips mm. to silicon chips, you know. Mm. And so that's how great of a change it has happened since 1953 to 2003. And so how is technology and what, because you represent the district uh, that has a lot of well-known companies. Yes. Intel, eBay, you were in eBay recently. No, Apple. Apple, so names that the world recognizes, you know, right. so how are you, um, what are the challenges for you when it comes to technology in terms of being a congressman and what do you have to do? Well, I, I think one of the major challenges is to make sure that um, Washington, D.C. understands how business is done in Silicon Valley. And um, the role that I would have would be to facilitate that interaction and making sure that representatives of uh, Silicon Valley companies have a venue and have a, a way to uh, share their information. I, I think uh, what we need to do uh, currently is to have entrepreneurs and folks who are really embedded in uh, the culture of business here, you know, work as interns or, or fellows in the different departments in Washington, D.C. or in offices where they can share that the um, the, the culture of Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley is not only a geographic place, it's a, it's a frame of mind, it's mm. a state of mind. And um, it's the ability to be able to be innovative, taking chances, taking risks. Failing. The ability to fail and not to quit. And, you know, it's taking the old Edison uh, mentality is, you know, I didn't succeed, I, I just know what I don't have to do next time, you know, mm. that kind of a thing. So, and, uh, but I think the critical piece here is that, um, is how Silicon Valley looks at establishing a business, mm. how they start a business, how they compensate those who are in startups, and it's much different than the traditional way of starting a corporation. Mm. 
And so, you know, when we look at problem solving, people have to have a different mindset and understanding of what uh, the companies here do and how they do that. And so, and they also have to understand, uh, DC has to understand that th this is the, um, the cradle of innovation and it is the genesis of all major changes that occur. So uh, if it weren't for Apple and the, the iTunes and the iPhones and the iPads and everything else like that, you know, we give credit to Apple and to Steve Jobs and to uh, Wozniak, but before that even happened, there was all kinds of innovations that happened prior to that. So they were able to take uh, and converge a lot of the uh, technologies into another uh, another gadget so that uh, we're able to have a phone that allows you to be talking, taking photos, and mobile, and be able to uh, send and receive information uh, mobily. And now uh, we're looking at trying to do it in real time and streaming it. And so uh, it's it's a very um, exciting place. The power of the the um, the, uh, the cell phones that we have in our hands right now. In the old days, in the 50s, would probably have taken a whole room, if not two or three rooms, in order to be able to have that kind of computing and uh, electronic power. So you, you, you bring up a very interesting thing about how things have changed from 53. You know, in the old days, it took you so long to get to San Jose and the power of that mobile phone in your hand. Yeah. But do you think we have lost something in this process where kids today sit in front of the computer all the time? You know, I'm on my mobile phone all the time. So kids, when you look at kids and students, they're so uh, m married to their devices. They've forgotten how to work with their hands, you know, like what your father did and what you probably did as a child. Do you think we have lost something in this process? Well, I, I think, uh, I'm not sure the word is lost, but evolved. <clears throat> you know, um, youngsters used to be able to um, go outside and play till it got dark. Which is what you probably did. Yeah. But um, the community and the neighborhood got more and more urbanized so that it became more and more uh, issues of coming home before it's dark, but always knowing where you are. So the, what the technology has done is collapse time and space and also um, allowed youngsters to have gadgets in their homes, in their hands, to keep them entertained and, and engaged. Uh, I, I think that the fact that we're talking about youngsters needing to get out more often and be able to um, uh, exercise more uh, has brought the issue of um, you know having exercise and having uh, outdoor exercise, but not so much setting aside your technology, but bringing it along with you so that uh, it has a, a greater use outside the home and outside the couch. Uh, GPS can tell you how to get around. Uh, GPS will be something that could uh, keep you from getting lost in even in neighborhoods you don't know about. A GPS can also help parents figure out where you are too, uh, which has been a dilemma for parents, especially fathers and daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? I'm sure you didn't use GPS on your kids. Um, didn't even know what GPS meant in those <laughs> days. But but today, when you look at people going to Peace Corps, compared to the time I was in Peace Corps, you know when we were isolated, we were isolated. When youngsters today are going to Peace Corps, if they have a a photovoltaic pack, they can charge their cell phones, their iPads, their um, PCs. And they can and, share their photos. And they can share information, keep in touch, and still be of service to the community that they're in. And, uh, and th then that kind of technology can be shared in the countries and the places that they are in because using photovoltaic and people start to get the idea that I can generate electricity using this on my the roof of my house or my hut because the sun is available and I can do that. So there's, there's always the upside to everything. It's just how you look at it. And, um, and I think that technology offers us the ability to be more efficient, um, collapse time and distance. But here's, here's a rub. In a society like ours where everything's moving quickly, 
efficiently, we have to learn to take time to smell the roses. And how do you do that? Um, Karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably one way, but uh, it's not smelling the roses. Uh, I, you know, I used to go fishing a lot, you know, surf fishing. But, you know, the idea of being able to slow down, because what we've done in our society is the efficiencies created more time to do the work. And in our workforce, I think that we have to stop and think about if our workers are being more efficient and they're being more productive, then we should either give them the time to uh, relax, to read, to converse with other folks, or compensate them a little bit more for the increase in productivity. And see, hmm. and because people complain that they're working longer, working harder, and more, and they're more productive, but they don't feel like you know they've been compensated, or they don't feel satisfied. And I think that that's the piece that's missing. So you say working longer, working harder, and not feeling satisfied. And I'm reminded about your grandfather who came at the turn of the 20th century. Sure. You became a congressman at the turn of the 21st century. So 100 years history in your family. Sure. You're a Sansei, third generation. Right. How do you think your grandfather would have reacted if he were to be alive today? Because they were all hard workers. Yeah, I, I think he would, uh, he would either adjust or just say, uh, I like the old ways, and you know, he can afford probably to, be, you know, if he were young and living today, he'd be part of the um, the uh, the crowd that wants to keep learning and, mm. you know, and be innovative. lifelong students. Sure. And what 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 about your father, who uh, who was, I guess, studying? He wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. But then World War Two happened. Right. And then. Uh, Pearl Harbor happened and you were interned. You and your family were interned. Right. And you were sent to Colorado. Right. That has left an impact on your family. And your father used to say, you have admitted in an article, you have to work 110% better. Well, that's, that's because um, the dominant society uh, has always been uh, putting pressure and, and uh, oppressing folks who are immigrants or who are different uh, people of color. And in order to just to make advances, you had to be able to prove yourself more than 100%, that you had to be able to show that uh, you're more productive. And, uh, but in doing so, uh, you still have to assert yourself to let people know that uh, you have these talents and skills. And so in, during the 50s and 60s, during the Civil Rights Movement, people were talking about we don't want to be equal and separated. We want to be part of the big picture. So separate and equal was a principle that just didn't fly. And so, you know, and my, my father and my grandfather knew that too. Uh, so uh, they each responded to that kind of a society in a different way. I respond to that uh, society in a way where I try to have move and work hard for inclusion. Uh, not exclusion, uh, to make sure that everybody has a voice and that everybody has the guaranteed protection of the Constitution. And because I took an oath to the Constitution, not to the government. Government can go awry, but our constitutions are contract between our government and our people. And all this uh, thinking of yours, the feeling that you have about inclusion and following the Constitution, all of that, stems directly from what happened to you and your family in uh, World War II? Yeah, I, I, I think that it has a great impact, uh, although subtle at first because when I was a child I didn't know. But as I was growing up, I saw the kinds of um, behavior that my parents and people in my community had, had gone through and um, and how they behaved and how they felt isolated or they s isolated themselves in their own what we call J-towns. Oh, they were known as J-towns? You know, J Japan yeah, towns Japan towns or you know, China towns uh, or Manila towns or Latino towns or ghettos, you know. All these things were created um, uh, not so much through the zoning laws but through different other kinds of subtle kinds of actions of uh, society and uh, ourselves too. 
And so, you know, understanding that, I think the job is to break down those barriers, um, make sure that people have a right to live where they want to live, create laws and zonings that allow, uh, you know, um, a mixed housings and things like that, you know, where people be able to interact and not be separated based upon color or class. How did you overcome your shyness? I, st I still am shy, you know, and I, I think you, you, you call it fear, too. Uh, I still get nervous in front of people in, in speaking. It doesn't uh, show? Uh, well, you know, if you saw how moist my, <laughs> my, my, my armpits are, <laughs> you know that the man is a little bit nervous. Uh, and and I, I think it's a natural reaction, and I, I think it's one reaction I don't want to lose because it keeps me sharp and on my toes. So. I know that public speaking is a difficult thing for me. I used to really um, physically react to uh, the idea that I had to speak in front of a class when I was a student. Um, but then one day um, I found out that this, this phenomenon called karaoke, as you say, <laughs> uh, was a phenomenon where you know, people started singing in public. A lot of people were really good, you know. And that was the worst thing I would ever do. But I found out that if I could do that, then public speaking would be a little bit easier. And I started out by doing that, singing in a corner. <laughs> oh. So you've been a karaoke singer for a long time. No, not really a long time. But my wife told me, uh, well, this fellow named Paul Fong challenged me to do a song and uh, asked a crowd, you know, how much would you be willing to pay to have Mike sing, and a friend of mine, she was a colleague in, at the Board of Supervisors, Diana McKenna, she yelled out and says, I would pay you $1,500 for him not to sing. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife told me, you ought to do that and just, <laughs> just sing our, our song. Uh, Which was? Uh, Moon River. Oh, okay. Because you know, our first date was Breakfast at Tiffany when we were in college. And that, that became, uh, I guess in her mind, our song. Uh, and. Um, you miss her? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Congressman, it was such a pleasure to have you on our show and talk to you. And you have completed 12 years at the Congress? On my 13th year, right? 13th year. And you are up for re-election in 2014. That's correct. And you've already raised how much money? Uh, I'll probably raise uh, up to 400000 right now, but I should raise close to, hopefully close to a million dollars by the end of the year. All the best with that. Well, thank you so much. And I thank you so that. much for stopping by. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Kamala. And thank you for watching. We'll be back again with another show. Goodbye. You have raised.